Hello and welcome. Today I'm joined by former Harlequins and Namibia international rugby player Ronaldo Bothmer. How's it going, Ronaldo? You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. You, Danny? I'm okay, thank you. Thanks for joining me. Talk to me then. So, how's how's life? How are you at the minute? Yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, busy with uh, with uh, with my own business at the moment. Um, obviously, it's Christmas time, so. Just got through Black Friday, um, so yeah, a lot, lot going on this side, but otherwise, yeah, just cr cracking on and uh, trying to um, get things sorted. Awesome, sounds great. So you mentioned kind of you're busy with business, so what, what's that? What's the business? What are you up to nowadays? Yeah, so I started my own fitness brand uh, when I was still playing at Arlequins, um back in uh, 2018. Um, so yeah, the business has kind of grown from there, so we are called Bothams, um, so it's essentially a massage guns recovery type of uh, business with sports equipment, apparel, um, we have numerous other little uh, sports equipment, um, we currently sell in UK, across Europe and also in South Africa, and we're also the kind of official recovery tech partner for South African women's hockey side, uh, and also the Blue Bulls um, as well in South Africa, and we also stock our products in about 50 retail stores in South Africa called Sportsman's Warehouse as well. So, yeah, the brand has kind of gone down that route where we've kind of taken a holistic overview of what uh, I've used as a player in, in my career, uh, products and stuff like that. And just basically we, we started our own business according to those kind of needs. Wow, that sounds amazing. And I do definitely want to touch on uh, elements of that um, a bit later on. So... Obviously, you used to be a professional rugby player to a, a very high level, uh, which is amazing. Talk to me about your, your transition. How was your transition period? No, it's been it's been really tough. Um, I've gone through a couple of, um, of a dips after I stopped playing rugby. Um, started abusing alcohol quite heavily a couple of times. Um, so, yeah, it's been, been an up and, and downward spiral, but things are, are definitely a lot better at the moment. Um, at least things have, have been kind of nurtured a bit from the, that point of view but yeah it's, it's, it wasn't a an easy transition um and also started playing again uh, about two years ago for a new kind of pro team in uh, israel called tel aviv heat uh, and they had a, a terrible career in the injury after that as well so yeah it's been kind of an up and downward spiral from stop playing rugby to then going trying to get back into it just to maybe see if i could have played in the the world cup uh, this year for Namibia, but that then obviously things ended very badly. Um, so, I mean, again, so that was kind of after going through all of that um, life after rugby, then getting back into it, and then, yeah, basically just repeating that whole process again. Mm. It must have been difficult to obviously, I mean, normally you just do it once, but to do it twice, it must have been obviously doubly hard for you. Yeah, I know. I mean, it, mentally, it was it was very, very bad. Um, but luckily, uh, the RPA was there to kind of assist in some of the kind of needs with uh, depression and alcohol abuse and all those things that I've that I went through. Um, so yeah, it was a good kind of not experience, but uh, I think I've I've learned a lot about myself over the last three years since since leaving Harlequins. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of bad, but there's also been a lot of good that I've taken out of out of it and hopefully the stuff that I've learned and the lessons that I've learned I could hopefully one day kind of assist uh, guys currently still playing um, in the same position and that they make don't make the same mistakes um, that I think a lot of uh, rugby players and pro athletes make these days as well um, around that thing and I don't think a lot or enough is spoken about life after um, sport um, it's a very very bad cycle um, I mean, I've spoken to so many guys over the last three years that's not in the same instances as me, but also kind of similar type of, of experiences and stuff that uh, happened to them as well. Mm. No, definitely. Um, it's, it's definitely something yeah. that's not spoke about enough. Um, so 100% agree with you on that. I mean, in terms of your, I know you mentioned about kind of um, delving into alcohol and, and, and depression. Did you get any help with regards to those things and also during your transition process from a, um, maybe an organization or family members or anyone at all? 
Yeah, so I think the the big thing about that is like I think rugby players are obviously we we label as kind of tough guys and hard guys, and I think that after you stop playing rugby, you try and kind of go into life in the same type of way. And after I stopped playing, like there was a lot of things. I mean, it was it changed so quickly, obviously with COVID and all those things. So it wasn't like a <clears throat> an easy transition where you kind of prepare yourself. For what's coming so I think obviously with COVID and then obviously we all stopped training and then it was the end of my kind of contract didn't didn't really re-sign with another club because I still wanted to stay in the UK for kind of life uh, a bit, better life for my family mm-hmm. so it was a kind of uh, upward spiral from there and then again it's just that I still had my business which was still keeping me busy and it just after a couple of months things really started to kind of creep in and again you didn't have that kind of support base I mean I was in in a team environment for, for 10 plus years where you are between 40 guys, 50 guys uh, uh, in a day, daily basis. And I mean, I'm, I'm, I was a very live wire for all the teams that I played with and always like to make jokes and try to be funny around the guys. So I feed it off those type of things. And then I went from that basically to where I'm sitting right now in an office on my own and working ridiculously long hours, not sleeping, um, and then you don't have any coping mechanisms. That's not something that you kind of get taught when you play rugby. So, mm-hmm. again, the only kind of way or escape that mm-hmm. I had was to, I mean, just take drink alcohol to kind of numb that whole feeling of not playing rugby, you're not playing in front of fans every weekend, you're not getting that drive or, or inspiration from your teammates, your coaches, physiotherapists, small little things like that that you don't think of when you're playing rugby, but when you come and sit in an office and you have the stress of, of kind of, you have to make your business work, otherwise you can't feed your family um, <clears throat> and you don't have any support structure behind you, that's when all of this type of depression and alcohol and those type of things comes in because that's like, it, it became a coping mechanism for me, um, which obviously wasn't the right thing to do, but at that time, that was the only kind of escape I had from kind of general life um, and just to kind of get through get through days. Mm. No, it must have been really, really tough. Yeah. And, and thankfully, you've kind of come through that now and you've obviously got your business to focus on, which is great. Talk to me about your transferable skills that you've taken from the rugby world, the rugby environment into kind of the business world to allow you to do what you're doing now. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously rugby is obviously a sport and you learn, I think, a lot of skills that you don't really think or you're aware of that you're learning. So I think just being resilient and I'm a very like motivated and driven guy. Um, I didn't get where I was in my career from getting things easily. I had to work extremely hard, go down very hard routes to get to kind of playing at the level that I played. Um, so again, I'm a very hard working person and, and very dedicated if I put my head on something, I, I always do achieve it. And, and I'm glad that I have that kind of thing in me. Um, so I think from that point of view, like obviously you meet a lot of people, um, but it's also up to what you make out of it. So if I have to go back now, there's a lot of things I would have done a bit differently. Um, when I was playing rugby, that was the only thing that I thought about. I didn't think about anything else. So from that point of view, obviously I made mistakes while I was still playing. Didn't think about all of these things. Luckily, I, I started a business, but it was not nearly kind of sufficient to where I am today. I could have done a lot more when I was playing to build up the business. Again, in South Africa, it's obviously a bit different. It was a bit easier for me to to kind of make different connections in, in all of the different environments that I am in currently with my business. Um, but yeah, there's opportunities definitely around. I know a lot of guys who's currently still playing, taking a lot of advantage of that um, kind of availability towards yourself and um, people that you meet on a on a weekly basis. So I think things are obviously a bit more, <clears throat> it is growing a bit. I think people are obviously speaking a bit more about life after rugby. A lot of things have happened to players like myself who has spoken about it publicly. Um, so I think there, there's definitely a bit more awareness around it, but I think there's still a, it's still a very bad Achilles heel um, in, in the sports industry. Definitely, definitely is an Achilles heel. It's something that, from what I see and my experience, is always approached in a bit of a negative way or kind of something that's put on maybe the back burner. It's kind of distant in the in the 
it's in the far distant kind of um, future, if that makes sense. And, and no one really wants to talk about it whilst they're playing. So, and I understand the, the reasons why, but on that basis, do you think retirement should be approached in a different way when it comes to kind of um, the sport and world? Yeah, I think from, from my point of view, and, and again, this is this is from a like a business point of view as well. I, I think clubs has a lot bigger responsibility after looking or looking after the players a bit more. Um, and I think it needs to move away from the point where you earn a salary while you play at a club, and and when you finish playing at a club, I mean, <laughs> you're gone. that's that's the hard reality of it. And in fairness, it's probably. It is. It's fine. I mean, you you were contracted for a period of time, um, but like I said, after obviously I have my own business. I just think the the value players add to a franchise or a team far outgrows anything that you obviously get paid for from a club's perspective. And I know a lot of clubs are obviously in financial difficulties in the UK and in South Africa and all those point of view. So I understand things are tough, but I think there is definitely a lot more. Clubs can do from that point of view. Uh, I mean, the amount of connections and stuff like that that the club has to their availability is something that can be kind of given to players a bit more openly. Um, again, this should also be driven by players. It's not something that the clubs can force on players, but I think it should be made made a lot more like available. And I think Harlequins, when I was still there, did, did do a lot of these type of things for players. I'm not sure how it is with other clubs at the moment or um, how it is at the moment, but I know Oliquist did try to kind of do things around that. Um, but again, I, I don't think there's there's enough done towards kind of helping players to prepare themselves for, for life after rugby. I think that's something that clubs need to think about on their part as well. It's not just having the guys play for you and then when the contract ends, they, that's the end of the story. I think the club also knows what's going on in a player's career, where they are currently, um, and obviously they have the they have the resources to help guys transition. And I do think there is probably some success stories out there um, around these things, <clears throat> but I'm not 100% sure. But I know, like I said, I think Harlequins has started doing some of these type of things while I was still at the club. Again, it's not something that I obviously looked into or was was well made aware of it, but yeah, I, I definitely know that it is something that is being uh, worked on. Amazing. Uh, um, I mean, you spoke about it earlier, where you mentioned about um, your career was quite short through injury. Uh, it's a knee injury, I believe. So, talk to me a little bit about kind of um, the injury and kind of what led to your kind of retirement. Yeah, so like I mentioned, I, I stopped playing rugby um, for about three years. And then uh, Dimitri Katakilis contacted me um, <clears throat> in August. Um, geez, I don't even know what year it was, but about, about two, three years ago. Um, and just asked me if I wanted to kind of get back to playing. And, and that was, I was at that point, kind of at the lowest point of kind of my depression and alcohol abuse back then. Um, and then just kind of said, yes, definitely, I'm, I'm keen to <clears throat> to join and, and see where we can obviously take it. And then from there, went and started playing again for, for Tel Aviv Eat, um, and then got a call up for, for Namibia again uh, for that November test and went to South Africa to play three tests for them again uh, in Cape Town. Uh, so, yeah, it's kind of things started planning towards preparing to play in uh, the World Cup that just uh, went past now. Uh, and then we had a semi-final in, I think it was April or March, <clears throat> for Tel Aviv Heat because the, the Russian team obviously got expelled from the Super Cup that was played um, when when the competition was a newly competition formed. Uh, then we I went over to Portugal, um, just kind of went over a ruck and someone cleaned me, my leg got stuck and my knee completely dislocated completely to the side uh, and uh, I've got a you've got to have a peroneal nerve or something on the side of your leg and that nerve stretched so it caused my foot to completely uh, parallel um, tore my ACL to all of my ligaments so I had like three operations after that and also like I said I had to get nerve nerve surgery as well and yeah, my foot's still paralyzed. It's, it's not uh, come, and, come back yet, so I don't have any feeling 
in my foot at the moment. So waiting for a kind of a nerve transplant as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that that was tough. And then after that, just kind of spiraled down that kind of alcohol abuse thing again um, for a couple of months. And then, yeah, completely stopped uh, drinking anything. I think it's almost more than six months now since I've had uh, one, one drop of alcohol. So I think luckily I've cleared that out of my system now. I think I had to go through some stuff in my life. It's unfortunately the life cycle. You have to go through a lot of things to make you a better person. So, yeah, luckily, uh, I'm kind of free of, of that um, release now. And like I said, luckily, the RPA really helped help out there in, in terms of helping setting up some meetings with psychologists uh, and stuff like that, just to kind of go through those type of injuries, <clears throat> which, again, I was not playing rugby. So they were very generous to assist me. So I, I really um, I'm glad about about that kind of structures and them assisting me in going through all of that. Well, um, I mean, firstly, I, I hope the kind of uh, the injury um, fixes itself in whatever shape, or way, or form moving forward um, for the better. Um, just got to stay positive with that one, as you know. And and congratulations on kind of your success with not touching alcohol for six months so far. So long may that continue as well. I mean, I always say adversity shapes us anyway. So you're obviously still here kind of you've been through what you've been through and it's only going to make you stronger and I'm sure you've probably heard those sentiments before anyway um in terms of obviously so you mentioned that you had um a career in rugby at international level so you, you basically represented Namibia which is amazing so talk to me about kind of what it was like to play on the international stage pulling that shirt on and obviously representing the Namib Namibia yeah, so obviously I made the decision to to obviously go and play for Namibia and, and not represent uh, South Africa. Um, and the reason why I did was just I, when I was still playing back then and I had the opportunity to play for Namibia before the 2015 World Cup. Um, kind of I wasn't kind of at the peak of my career in South Africa and, and didn't play kind of super rugby at that time. So for me, it was a decision because I saw an opportunity for that. Um, so, yeah, it was a great opportunity for me to go and represent Namibia um, as, as a country and, and obviously captain them as well for for two years. Um, so, yeah, I think from an international career, I mean, that was that was amazing. And, and playing in the World Cup 2015 was was unbelievable. Uh, till today is probably one of my my biggest kind of um, memories in my rugby career. Uh, um, and also, just like I said, re representing Namibia, which is a very small country, um, just over 2 million people, um, the amount of passion of those people and, and just kind of showing Namibia to the world in a, in a bit of other way than people are obviously normally seeing it as a, as a small country. So, yeah, I mean, for me, obviously a lot of people say, well, why don't you represent South Africa or anything like that? But at the time, it was my kind of best way forward for my career. And yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm happy I did it, and it was, it was a huge honour representing Namibia um, as well. Mate, that's that's really amazing, and, and to represent any any country at international level and, and be recognised, uh, and also captain the, the the country as well, that's amazing. So, uh, congratulations for that. I'm always intrigued by people who um, run their own business, especially when they've had a career in professional sport to the level that you have. So, what's it like to? I know it's probably going to be. Um, quite hard to put in maybe a couple of sentences, but what's it like to run your own business? It's tough. It's definitely not easy. Um, it's it's a very, very tough, tough world to be in. And like I said, you are basically thrown into the deep end right from the start. Like I said, there's a lot of things that you obviously have to learn about business. And I mean, I've made so many mistakes over the last five or six years since I've had my business. And unfortunately, you've, you've got to make those mistakes in, in business, in life to obviously succeed at some point. Um, so, yeah, I mean, from, from that point of view, I mean, I've, I went from playing rugby to basically at the moment running a, a, a business worldwide, designing my own websites, doing all of my kind of marketing, doing everything on my own with obviously some help from, from people that obviously works for me. But, yeah, you, you learn a kind of whole new side of yourself. And I think that's the... Well, the upside about obviously going from from rugby to just nothing is you you learn a lot about yourself and 
other skills that you might not have kind of learned when you were playing rugby. You didn't really think about those type of things. But like I said, luckily I did put some sort of thing in place while I was still playing. I was always busy with with something on the side. Um, and luckily, like things has kind of gone away that I can obviously just put food on the table. It's still obviously a, a young brand and it'll take a lot of years to build it up into something big. But I think I'm, I'm happy with where we are currently or what I've kind of set up um, to where we are now. But like I said, this unfortunately you make a lot of mistakes and a lot of things goes by that you, you don't think of because you didn't really know with those skills with business and all those things. But yeah, it's, it's how, how the world works and you've got to learn at some point. 100%. And that's amazing. And, and like I said before, long may that continue. Uh, I did have a quick look at the, the website for the business as well. And you've got some cool stuff on there. So um, I'm sure there's a load of kind of athletes out there that are buying your stuff. And, and uh, if they're not, then hopefully they will be after this. So now, well done on that. And, and like I said, hopefully that continues moving forward. Um, in terms of help, I know you mentioned earlier you had a little bit of help um, kind of when you were in your transition period, but maybe not enough. Do you think more help's needed for athletes when it comes to approaching retirement, approaching transitioning from sport to another career? Yeah, no, 100%. But I think also that the big thing about it is like the players need to take a responsibility. In it. It's not a club's responsibility to look after your kind of after life, after rugby. They can obviously assist you in a lot of ways, but and they obviously, I think they should do a lot more about it because it's not something that is spoken about. And like I mentioned earlier, I think clubs aren't always transparent about where they are with players and, and when or how long a player is going to be contracted for. I think those decisions are, I mean, easy for coaches to make. They know exactly who they want to keep on at a club or who they want to let go. So I think if someone kind of ends there or gets to that point in their career where the club feels that that guy might not sign or stay on with them for for more than a year or two, or to say, listen, you are still contracted with us, but there's, there's an opportunity for you to maybe do some extra um, coaching or some business experience or whatever the case may be. I think it's, it's a conversation that needs to be kind of openly discussed with players, with the clubs, because like I said, they have the resources in every field. I mean, they have sponsorships, they have they have guys with, with experience. So, the clubs have more options available to players while they're still playing rather than trying to do something after you kind of retired. Because that's, again, when you play rugby, people see you as a hero. And when you stop playing rugby, people forget about you. I mean, there's there's not a lot of people that you still speak to after rugby. And, and there's always a thing about, yeah, you'll still do this and that. But it, it, it never works like that. When you finish with rugby, you're out of it. It's, it's not a lot of people that... Um, continue down that kind of rugby cycle. It, it's a very, very kind of small type of uh, family that's running around in that circle. So when you finish with rugby, you, you're you not a Brian Abana or someone like that. It's going to be difficult for you to continue down that road. So, yeah, it, it's something players obviously need to take a responsibility in terms of setting up a business or setting up some sort of savings or some work experience, studying. And I know it's, it's impossible to obviously do that full time while you're still playing rugby. But again, I think that's where the club can obviously come in and, and assist guys who are going to be ending at the end of their career to maybe make some time available for those guys to look at some other ventures um, in work experience on their off days or something like that. It's amazing. And you kind of answered my next question because uh, I, I tend to always end with, uh, from like an athlete's perspective, whether you're uh, a young professional athlete or one that's slightly older, maybe coming towards the end of your professional career. Have you got any advice to those guys and, and girls with regards to aiding their transition from sport to another career? Yeah, well, I think if you're still young, I think the, the most important thing players should do is obviously look at themselves as a brand and, while you play rugby, try to build yourself and your brand as big as you possibly can in terms of your own kind of worthiness towards companies. So you can obviously get some sort of endorsements or work closely with brands and, and people that when you obviously do end your career or something like that, you have those contacts in place with people that you've obviously worked with 
or done work with or stuff like that. Um, because I mean, at the end of the day, your your brand as a as a rugby player is something that would obviously transition into to work. So if you've worked with brands in the past, um, if it's endorsing their products or whatever, just kind of learn from that experience and try and see how big you can obviously try and grow your own personal brand itself. Because that's at the end of the day something that might make something in the future. Because people obviously purchase products from people that they know or stuff something like that. So depending on what obviously you want to do after sport. But I think it's important to to build something up for yourself in, in different avenues, not just kind of saving money or, or stuff like that. You need to be mindful of a lot of factors around that. That's great advice. Um, really, really awesome. I appreciate your time today, Ronaldo. I know you're really, really busy. Um, just in terms of your business, I just want you to promote your business again. Let everyone know kind of where we can find you, whether it be on social media, the name of the company again and, and the website is uh, detailed as well for you. Yeah, so the company's name is called Bothams. Um, so it's B-O-T-T-H-M-S. Uh, so it obviously comes from my surname, Botma. Um, yeah, so they can just find it on Bothams.com. Um, all of our products are on there. And uh, we also stock some stuff on Debenhams and Mountain Warehouse as well. So yeah, that's basically uh, what we do. We've, we've got our own kind of recovery sports training and we're also launching two new apps in in the new year as well so a lot of kind of fitness orientated type of things um and also just looking after the complete wellness aspect and that's what we're doing with with our app and, and just trying to see how we can incorporate everything um into getting people to to live a healthier and lifestyle and obviously being a lot more healthier will, will make you wealthier at the end of the day as well so yeah, just incorporating all of those things um, and the same what we're doing with all of our team apps and team wear apparel and all those things. So we've got a lot going on as a brand, which obviously is not not seen in, in the public. But yeah, we do, we do team wear and supporters apps. So we're working closely with SA Women's Hockey side and the Bulls with some new tech and stuff that we're launching. So yeah, a lot of exciting things um, happening at, at Bothos. Sounds amazing. And personally, where can we find you on social media? Yeah, so I'm just uh, at Ronaldo Botma. Um, not a massive social media guy. Um, just busy with my with my work and my my two kids and my wife. So not a social media guy. Um, but yeah, I am I am online as well. Awesome. No, brilliant. Like I said, really appreciate your time. Great insight into your career and obviously your transition from um, kind of rugby to owning your own personal kind of uh, business. Amazing. Um, have a great day. Uh, good luck with uh, everything you're looking to do. Thanks, you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, okay. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.